Greetings, Zimplatz family. I'm Edith Mazio Fatafuma with Vitality Wellness. I'm back again to support your workplace wellness programs. Uh, last year, as you recall, we were continuing and the discussions around health and a part of health that we uh, really pushed for was the aspect around mental health. And when we concluded our discussions last year, we had all sort of come to the space where we're in agreement that there can be no health that we can speak of without complete uh, physical health, mental well-being, as well as social well-being. These three add to what we can term health. And um, in that series, we discussed many mental health disorders typically presenting in Zimbabwe. We looked at the uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. We also talked about um, the schizophrenia uh, spectrum and other psychotic disorders, including bipolar, trauma, as well as substance-related and addictive disorders. Uh, so today, carrying on with that discussion and because what we have seen in our environment, that these issues of mental health and substance um, disorders are continuing uh, because of alcohol or substance abuse, uh, they continue to persist and we do see them within the workplace. We do face challenges at family level and in our societies. So today we are joined by a young Zimbabwean um, who is Munya Chidzonga. Welcome, Munya. Thank you. Thank you for having me and hello, Zimplas family. Okay, thank you, Munya, for coming. Munya would, uh, will share with us this morning on his journey as a recovering alcoholic. And um, we are so happy that um, he has agreed to partner with us and to come and share his story and hopefully we all learn from from that journey if not at a personal level our families and friends can also benefit from Munya's story welcome Munya and um, please just go ahead and introduce us to who is Munya okay uh, well thank you again for having me um, so Munya is a husband and father, a creative entrepreneur, an award-winning actor and a film producer. But I think first, well, not first and foremost, but most importantly, a recovering alcoholic. Um, I'm glad you use the word recovering instead of recovered because it's an ongoing process. Um, recovery has taught me that alcoholism is a disease. And because it's a disease, it's not something that you can take a pill for and then it goes away. Uh, obviously, I'm not a clinical expert, I'll, I'll leave that uh, to, to, to you, but uh, what saved my life was uh, a program, a 12-step program that deals with alcoholism on a mental, physical and spiritual level because we feel that that's what the disease affects. So through the grace of God and through the practice of this program, I'm sober. I've been sober about three and a half years now. Ah, congratulations. Thank three you. and a half years. Three and a half so years. then the term should be you are recovered. Yes. Mm -hmm. You are recovered. recovered. You are a recovered alcoholic. Yeah. But how did you even get there? How did it all start? Wow. Um, I, think, I think it started with, it's always a, it's always a difficult conversation. You know, one, one of the conversations someone was asking me is that, was it something that, were you triggered by something? You know, is it something that happened in your life? You know, uh, because from all, for all intents and purposes from the outside, I have a very good life. You know, I, 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 my, I was raised in a, in a loving home. My parents sent me to, I believe, some of the best schools in Africa. Um, and I have a beautiful family, beautiful wife, and three wonderful kids um, that keep me old. Um, but I, I think what happened was, I was born an alcoholic. I just didn't know it and I didn't realize it. And alcohol wasn't the problem. Sorry if I can, I can stop you there. Right. When you say I was born an alcoholic, can you unpack that? Are you saying that is it, you have a genetic trait or a genetic disposition which um, is triggered when you take alcoholic substance? I wouldn't, I'm not sure whether it's, again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm no scientist. I'm not sure whether it's genetic, mm -hmm. but someone like me has a propensity uh, for alcoholism. You know, alcoholism is a progressive disease. So 
What do you mean someone like you? Because um, I'm hearing, sorry, I have to it's okay. do this. It's okay. We have to unpack this. Because there are some people who believe out there that uh, any form of substance abuse, kujitisa, mm. kujaitwa, and a lot recently you hear that uh, it's a privilege ah. uh, issue. And then you did go to some of the best schools. You grew up in, in, a, in a loving family. Your parents could afford a certain lifestyle. Right. Is it because of the privilege that um, you had access then to, or you had extra ah. resources which led you to indulge in, in alcohol? So um, the simple answer is no. Uh, when, I, when I say someone like me, um, the, the, the easiest way to put it is that I've got a mind that cannot process reality okay. and a body that cannot process alcohol. So when you combine those two, it's a very deadly combination. So it's not necessarily about the environment as much as it is about how the person interacts with the environment. Because you can have, I mean, in the same household, you can have three children growing up exactly the same and two are okay and then one decides to fall by the wayside. So it's not necessarily linked to genetics or even, it's not really a nature or a nurture thing. It's just the way that, that I was created, that I, I, I react to things differently. And there's certain tools that I didn't pick up because I didn't realize that I had this disease. It's like anything, if you, if you don't know that you've got a flu and you take medicine for a headache, the flu won't go away. You know, it'll always stay with you and you'll keep coughing and you're like, but why am I coughing? It's because you're taking the wrong medicine for what you have. So it wasn't necessarily uh, uh, an affluence thing because there are people without means who are addicted and uh, to certain substances. And remember, I think at the core of substance abuse is addiction. And addiction, addiction is a response to certain stimulus within a person. Um, this is my understanding. Again, I must you know, reiterate mm -hmm. that. It's, so that's why I was saying alcohol wasn't the problem. The problem was my inability to, to process life the right way. Alcohol was my solution. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it's just not a good solution. Solution to environmental factors and environmental triggers. Solution to my inability to deal with environmental factors and okay. environmental triggers. So you used alcohol as a crutch. Could we say it was a crutch for you? E yes, actually. I think it would, I would say a crutch, but more of a painkiller. Okay. okay. Because it, when you say a crutch, a crutch almost sounds like, uh, like it's, uh, it's, it's helping you along. You know, a crutch is a good thing. When mm. someone is using a crutch, they're, they're being helped to walk while they recover. So alcohol is not a crutch. It was a painkiller. It was, it was detrimental. You know, um, there, there are other good addictions. I mean, mm -hmm. some people are addicted to... Um, to service, to helping people. That's a good addiction. Some people are addicted to... But I wouldn't say so because mm. the minute it becomes an addiction, right. it is not good. Anything done in excess. Ah, and even enough. if you are a loving, caring person and you, you don't have boundaries and you never say no to people, you get depleted. True. So it's, yeah. it's also that even as you... If anyone decides to be a mother, Teresa, you have to also understand that there's a point where you have to self-care because people who are naturally givers yeah. and who, who give of service, there's a tendency that people may want to abuse them in the process. So it's also part of the wellness discussions yes. that we have that self-love is key and yeah. that people should learn to put themselves first. And they're actually people we need to teach to learn to say no and to set healthy boundaries. Yeah. Um, so Munya, when you were having these, um, when you realized that this is now an addiction, right. what made you realize that? Were there behaviors or things that you did um, then in, in the aftermath you would realize that uh, this is not right, this is not correct, I could have handled this better? Yeah. I'm glad you, um, thank you for that point of correction and you're absolutely right, excess, anything in excess is bad. Um, because there are some people who can drink but not take it to excess. The realization that I was an alcoholic, well, there's what we call a rock bottom, mm -hmm. which is where you are at your, your wit's end. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, the simplest way, uh, the best way to describe it is that life becomes too painful. So you don't want to live, but the thought of death is inconceivable. So you're sort of stuck in this place in between where your life is hard and the only time 
life is sort of bearable is when you're drinking. But then when you're drinking um, or using substance, the, the, the outcome is always, it's, it's always bad. So remember I mentioned it's a threefold disease, physical, uh, mental, and spiritual. So physically, you feel terrible. So you go and you take a drink. Mm -hmm. And then the things that you do physically when you're drunk or the aftermath of drinking make you feel bad because you hurt people. You hurt the ones you love, you know, and that affects your, 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 mental, your mental health. So mentally, your, your mind is telling you, no, I feel terrible, so I need a drink. And then the whole cycle starts again. And all of these bad things affect your spirit. So eventually you end up carrying around this, this terrible baggage of negative energy. And that's what leads you to realize that for, for me, I mean, that's what made me realize that, no, no, this thing is not something, I can't keep living like this. You know, it's not, it, it comes a point where it's not fun, you know, and it, it, it becomes, anytime you need to drink, it's, it's, it's not normal. Let's talk about the breakdown moments, the meltdown, the realization that it has to be different. You have to start living differently and mm. you have to acknowledge that you have a, this problem that you need to, 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 to overcome. At your worst, what would you say um, you did to your family and your loved ones? Wow. That's At a, your worst. That's a, yeah, that's a... That's a, that's, a, that's a hard one. I think I, was very, I became very unreliable. And um, there's an insanity. I mean, you know, the, Einstein's definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But I became unreliable. And the things I did was insane. I would be driving my family home drunk from parties and, you know, events. I became antisocial. You know, it, if we were drinking in a room, I would always be more drunk than everyone else. And I would make sure that I got drunk quicker. And I, th I thought it was because I had more ability, but I just drank more mm -hmm. because I didn't have that trigger that says, no, you should stop. Um, I stopped, I started, iso I, I started, I began to isolate myself. I had, my friends all left me because people don't want to hang around you because, you know, they feel like, okay, this guy is a, this guy becomes a liability. You know, like, you know, if, if you're invited to a family function, you know, she had sweeter braai or something. They just know that, mm, but munyaga oyaga, it's going to ruin everything because I'm going to end up arguing with people, fighting with people, and just being a nuisance, you know. Um, so it, it really affected my family. I, I remember, and I always, I always credit this to, 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 to God, as I understand it, my higher power, that, you know, my, my wife was about to leave. And, you know, my, my, my father was fed up. My, I think I remember the one moment when I realized, okay, this is bad. I remember um, coming home um, quite late. And for some reason, it made sense for me to take off all my clothes. And then I ended up in the lounge watching TV. And I remember in the morning waking up completely naked from head to toe. And my son, I think he was six years old at the time, was sitting next to me. And he had put like a little blanket, he had this little blanket that he'd carry around and he had covered me with it. And when I woke up, when I came to, this little boy was sitting there and I said, hey, hey, Papa, how are you? And he was like, no, I'm okay, Dad. I just, I was protecting you. You looked like you needed protection. And that, that broke my heart. And I cannot explain, I think it's very hard if you're not a father to explain what that feels like where you realize that, okay, look, this is, I'm supposed to be a man and an example to this young man. And yet he's looking at me, trying to help me. So it, it really did affect uh, a lot of people. And fortunately, um, my, my second son was a year old. So I don't think he saw, he might have felt, because children are very aware of spiritual... Very perceptive. Very, very perceptive. And you know, they, they perceive things on an emotional level as well. I think he could feel the tension because he, he, was, he was quiet. He would cry a lot. And you know, even the six-year-old, he didn't know what was wrong, but he knew there was a problem. Um, so that, that broke my heart and that was the moment I realized that, okay, something has to be done. Something definitely has to be done about this. Thank you, Munya, for sharing um, that part of your journey and for allowing us, um, by being vulnerable and, and, and sharing your story with us, 
Um, when we had these conversations about the mental health uh, disorders and challenges that we that typically present in Zimbabwe, the, the last time we had um, a practicing psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Tarisai um, Mere, who came and talked about mostly cognitive behavior therapies. Today, Munya would like to share with us his treatment um, plan which he calls the therapy, which is a 12-step program. So, Munya, can you tell us how uh, that 12-step program works and how you used it uh, for your journey to a recovered uh, alcoholic that we see today? Wow. Um, yeah, th thank you. Thank you for that. Um, because there is a solution, and I think that's the, that's the one thing that... Um, I'd really love to get across is that there is a way out and um, fortunately I so what happened is I after hitting that rock bottom um, you know I'm, a, I'm from a traditional home so my parents obviously thought that no uh, let, let's he needs prayer so we tried to go to people to pray for me and then well, I'm moving out no um, or whatever you know and there's my maple and all those things that we attributed to um, so they tried to get me prayed for, they tried to take me to traditional healers and all these things, but none of it worked. Um, the only thing that worked was this program that I, that I came across. Um, all I can mention about it is that it, it is a 12-step program and it's basically, it's a way of life, which is why the, even the term recovering for me is okay because it's, a, it's an ongoing process. I think the hardest thing about giving up substance, any substance or any addiction is it's not the saying no and letting it go. It's what do I do next, you know? If it's a Saturday and Chelsea is playing Arsenal, what do I do? I'm used to, sorry, I had to throw that out there. Uh, I'm a fan of neither. I'm just, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, what do I do if I'm surrounded by my families at a braai? How do I drink? What do I, you know? So this 12-step program is basically a guide for life. And it, it actually, it changed my life. I think being an, well, not I think, I know being an alcoholic is actually the best thing that ever happened to me because it taught me how to live. It taught me how to love. You know, um, I've been married for, for, for 10 years and, uh, sorry, 10, 11 years this year. Please don't, please don't tell my wife. Don't, 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 don't they tell know, her. all women okay. know. Ask a man yeah. how old the children are. How long have you been married? Yeah, yeah I, I was just thinking, uh, 10 can be right. I know your, your first child is 13 years old. Yes, so, <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, it's uh, yeah, we, uh, we were one of those who had, uh, we, had our, we wanted to be very, uh, very uh, forward thinking. So we had our own page, we made our own page boy okay. two years before. Oh, wow. And then he's the one who carried the rings at our wedding. That's how we planned it. Beautiful Thank story, you. yeah. But uh, yeah, we've been married for uh, 11 years this year. And for seven years of that marriage, I didn't love my wife and I didn't love my family. And this is the thing. Did you love yourself though? That was the thing. I didn't, I hated myself. Mm. And I, I didn't love Munya. And it wasn't until I got into this program of recovery that I learned how to love Munya and accept Munya and realize that Munya is not that bad, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and once I did that, it, it opened up a whole world of possibilities. And now I love my children, I love my wife. And she's actually an amazing woman. I mean, if I had known, <laughs> I would have started loving her before. But yeah, yeah. you know, I, I, so the 12-step program is just, it's more of a way of life. It helps you mentally, uh, physically, and spiritually. But it's a program of action. It's simple, but it's not easy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a program of action. It forces you to confront, uh, you know, your life and to confront people that you've wronged. So it forces you to go and, and deal with very, very uncomfortable situations. But... The great thing is that you're not alone. Once you get into the program, there's others like you or like me. And I think for me, that was the strongest, the strongest gift. And I feel like, you know, I, I, I've been exposed to a number of different treatments um, for substance abuse because I, I try and work with as many alcoholics as possible. I feel like this is the most effective because it's, it's the most inclusive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it's not based on a certain school of thought, either religious or uh, medical, and this is not, I'm not saying that it's a one size fits all. It allows you to find a solution that works for you. But I, what I'm also hearing that it's going to take a lot of commitment um, from the individual who, yeah. is, who has come to the realization that I have a problem and I need to do 
something about this. So yeah. it was the commitment. You also said something to me, Munya, before we started, that right. if someone is uh, abusing any substance and they don't do anything about, about it, you said there's definitely three things that will happen if, if a person doesn't take action. I think for our viewers, it's very important for you to tell us those three things that you have seen with your own eyes right. and that you know from your journey that these three things will happen. Oh yeah, so there's only three outcomes. One is you'll be institutionalized in a mm -hmm. mental institution. The second is you will go to jail. The third is you will die. And it doesn't, and every single alcoholic goes through those three phases. Not necessarily in order. Some people start with, well, so you can't really start with death and then go to jail. But you know, some people will start with uh, jail and then go to an institution. And by institution, I mean like a rehab or, or like a, a, a wellness center mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, but those, those things are inevitable. And if you, even if you listen to anyone who is an alcoholic, and I keep saying who is, because f through this program, I've learned that you can never, you can't diagnose someone as an alcoholic. Well, you can, but if you want that person to recover, they themselves have to first of all admit that I have a problem. Mm -hmm. And that is actually the first step of the 12 step program is you admitted we were powerless, that our lives had become unmanageable, you know? And it's a, it's a program that's taught around the world. It's applicable to many different styles of therapy. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, no. Munya. No and I think this is really a sobering thought for our viewers. Uh, from Munya's point, and I think I agree with him, that if you are an alcoholic or you have uh, a problem with any substances, um, intoxicating substances, you have to think about, if I can't continue on this path, mm -hmm. What will happen to me? Am I going to end up in an institution? Am I going to end up in jail? Or am I going to end up uh, dead because maybe I've, uh, you've committed suicide or you have put yourself in risky situations? We also discussed um, throughout our program last year that what substances do is that they lower our risk perception. So when we've removed that risk perception, it's, uh, anything can happen. So we would like to thank Munya for coming to share his story with us. And hopefully we will think hard on the things that he had um, spoken to us about so that we can prevent ourselves ever becoming dependent on any substance and that we can also find ways to help our loved ones who may be dependent on alcohol or any other um, uh, hard drugs. Um, so we hope this discussion has been helpful and uh, thank you again Munya for coming. We will be back in the second segment. Uh, welcome back to our second segment. Hello, Mr. Masimba. Hi, Edith. How are you? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. How, um, how are you, Simplest Family? We are back again. <laughs> uh, Mr. Masimba, mm -hmm. we heard from Munya's story. Mm -hmm. uh, his journey with addiction towards um, his recovery. And um, he spoke about hard hope, hard hitting truths you know, mm -hmm. and he talked about how the addictions affected uh, not just his family life, but physically and um, the mental aspects as well as spiritual aspects. Uh, what are the reflections did you get from Munya's journey to recovery? Thanks, Edith. I, th I think the, the beginning point is um, what do drugs do to us? and what's the target of the drugs when they enter our bodies? It would be interesting to know that drugs affect our brains. Okay. And our brain being the, the engine of the whole functionality of a human being, it means everything else you do is now generated by a brain that's affected by drugs. We will look at, um, uh, from Munya's story, issues of self-neglect. I think Munya said um, he began to hate himself. 
and maybe this hatred, the more you drink, the more the hatred grew, like he was talking of a cycle. Um, you, you drink to get out of the problem. When he gets sober, he realizes he created another problem in his drunkenness. Then he goes back to drink again to get more, more drunk and so on. So if you look at workers in our mining in, uh, industry, for instance, we know the zero tolerance uh, policy of Zimplas in terms of accidents. We know the issues of discipline in a mining environment. When a person goes through this cycle, and unlike Munya, who probably hates his family, you go to work and make mistakes. Mm -hmm. then that gets you into trouble all the time. And then what happens next? Society general ostracizes you. Even if, remember at Zimplas, they've got this policy where an error by one results in the punishment for the rest of the group. An accident means no bonus for everybody. I think we were told that yes, at some yes. point. So if you are the guy who always denies everybody else a bonus because of your personal life and personal choices that you have made, you become an ostracized, a disliked person, a stigmatized, a disliked person. And it's, a, it's piling on your issues already because first of all, it was a personal problem that you were drinking for. Now society is putting more pressure on you. That gives you even more reason to keep drinking. Uh, people who also uh, go on drugs have a problem of um, uh, loss of opportunities. Uh, I've spoken to the guys at the mine where they're saying, ah, we pan up at oh, we never get the opportunities, even if we're in or sometimes you're an engineer and you have to do a job really fast. But also look at what else you bring to the mining environment. Very good academically, but mm -hmm. because of alcoholism, yes. and probably when you are being prepared for a promotion to become a supervisor, a foreman, somewhere along the way your performance just went psh, because of your own fault. what Munya talked about. But at the end of the day, to trace up backwards to know that not And, and it's that ownership, isn't it, uh, Mr. Masimba? Yeah. Uh, we really want mm. to own mm -hmm. that we are also the problem. Yeah. The, the mm -hmm. tendency to blame external factors. And mm -hmm. Munya said, as long as you don't admit that mm -hmm. you have a problem and commit mm -hmm. to an intervention, mm -hmm. um, there will be a change in Oya. No behavior change will happen. Yeah. Alcoholism, I think, cannot get addiction. It's more like a, a spider's web. Mm -hmm. You can pull it to Shodambuka. But the more you, you, you take my drug ZYO, this turns into a very strong rope which you can break. So good if people would realize good into the problem and accept that they have a problem, each thinner and weaker, they could break it. But sometimes we go so deep to a point you could have much more expensive and much more advanced methods you could manage a problem. So I agree with you, could blame is another problem where people say somebody's doing this to me. He is a star, he is on TV, he is on radio. People think that he is a star. My addicts generally don't want to own up to their problems because they always point at another person. And the tendency is manipulative behavior. Manipulative behavior where, where I know it is wrong everybody around. I know it is wrong everybody around. Then they blame you for being too fussy. Ah, I am not going to say that 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 I am not to say that I am not going to say General, kuni yeba kuleta muna mao colleagues kaka shinji kancho ndeko kuti as kuda kuti vanwa ite pry into their lives. So vanu this tendency ku blocker from a distance. Do not dare kuastrek ni ropu tamba njenu tamba drugs and so on. When I come home, I start telling you a story. You know, sanitizer my bedness. In a way, you kuti ndino appear like nda zongo dako nda sanga la bamba ni nukubawa, but it was not about me. Nda tu tenga rodo reda ningi. Uh, it's a victim, a victim narrative. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know why people are so surprised about this. Uh, I was not as drunk as you are claiming. 
Eh, Zamunda katora mane runda kada kwa sasa mukundi ya pera ine vasi those things very 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 eh, good at that. Eh, Kasi nchini kuna generate kwa nini? Kasi nchini kuna kuni ya pera kuno bamu guilt kuno bamu shame as well. Um, if mungar sa ma family siam babu ano popo tastri kusiku ese mangwana cha amuki seven eight nine ten kuto kumtara angwa raji juu kiti ka the mind recollects kuti I think something happened man rich some farmers are gonna go. Saka ah isai kufuti ato shopping zafuti yego ti a popo ta usiku ese a tukira man isai apka nyafe ni chamu mbadi next day is very ashamed he wakes up takes a bath and disappears from home mm -hmm. where does he go beko ako kuya foot yeah. odzo ka kwa da kwa even worse generally drugs also break the social fabric um, there are so many things in our culture that are very good so many things that we are taught culturally so many things that we are taught, taught even from a religious perspective but once a community has got a few guys who are drug addicts there is this tendency one way the community is branded. Um, those things happen. Um, right in Zimbabwe, people mm. tend to, to, to call a whole district or a whole area. So, social fabric, destroy your issues of sexual and gender based violence in your increase because. If you are pushing a woman for a sexual favor and she's say, she's resisting, in your state of uh, drunkenness, in your state, you can drugs here. I will go and you tell where a no is a no and where a yes is a yes. Sometimes what you want to do is to do selfishness. Can you get a couple? Um, pane issue immorality no lida kuma disease wakari. We have been fighting as a country, jana HIV transmission and so on. But we find that when people go through my issues, my addictions, where choice of partnerships and uh, use of protection, all those things go down. To a point where kutu nyangwa ene shiwe, rishashwa is only done STI. Kutu nurapuka kwa chwe is an issue. And to that some people, antu mtakura kwenda kuchipatara, is separation kutu da atu rapuke. Ie pachake, they never see anything wrong with themselves. Uh, I think we had uh, Munya saying some of these things. Uh, Kune wa chini wa parents, wa kuma na wa chini wa young families that tina wamu no mai nedu mzimplats. Let's also know kutu ma drugs chayo, anu gona ku alter ma hormones, ku alter um, your body system to a point you, where you can have ma disabled ch children ku ma drugs. Um, something chawaka, chawaka jika iwe, chawaka kwa passed on to the next mm -hmm. generation. Saka, let's also be very kind and generous to our own kids, to our own families um, as workers and at an individual level. But like Munya said, I think this whole thing, it begins with you. Absolutely. Mm. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Masimba. Um, as we continue our workplace wellness program, we need to acknowledge. Mm. I think that's uh, one of the key things that has to happen. Acknowledge meant from the wellness programmers that these are issues that can be facing our employees' uh, addictions, substance mm -hmm. addictions, and how these have potential to impact uh, our employees' mental health as well as their productivity. And to make sure that we put in place the correct psychosocial supports mm -hmm. uh, in our workplace, which uh, can support uh, our employees who need this support to get the help that they need. And then to the employees will say, it takes you, it's going to take you. And as Munya said, we need to acknowledge at an individual level that we have a, a predisposition or that we have a challenge uh, that we need to address. And I will end today's session with a quote that I've taken from Munya where he said he got to a point where he realized that one drink was too little and too many drinks are never enough. So I will leave you with uh, that reflection and we will be back um, in a couple of weeks where Munya is going to unpack for us the 12th step uh, therapy that he went through. Thank you and until then, stay healthy. Goodbye. This program is brought to you by Zimplat in partnership with Vitality Wellness, Firstlink and Soulmate.